Well, I think it is 5.30, so we'll get underway, folks. Um, well, welcome, everyone, to uh, the Data Range Meetup. It's also a combined DBT Meetup as well, um, which is really cool. It's uh, great to do a online DBT Meetup. We've been a bit slack on the DBT side of things. I think with COVID and everything, everyone's been a little bit snowed under. So it's great that we've got two DBT talks tonight with Hamza and uh, Dom Collier from uh, Fivetran. I think uh, they're going to be really great fun. Um, so um, we've got data wrench meetups in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. So we just sort of during the COVID era combined the whole lot. Um, um, this is our kind of website. You know, we're you know reusing a lot of the data wrench bytes. If you went to their conference, um, you know. Uh, and we're also using the same YouTube channel to output this uh, live stream. So if you're on there, say hello. Um, let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. Always fun to hear. Um, it'd be great to find out who's actually out there, who's actually using DBT in production. I'm very keen. We, we were um, sort of having a chat before amongst um, all the speakers try to figure out like how many companies are actually using DBT in Australia. So if you are actually using DBT in production, it'd be, um, and if you're comfortable with sharing, it'd be great to find out which company you're from and um, like what sort of stuff you're using DBT to solve. Cool. So um, today, actually, um, I've got the pleasure of um, welcoming our co-organizer, Vinci uh, from Canva. She's um, she's going to help out as the co-organizer of the DBT meetup. So, um, Vinci, uh, tell us a few words about yourself, uh, what you do in your day job, and uh, what your experience with DBT is like. And you know, uh, yeah. Cool. So, hi, my name is Vinci. I am currently a data analyst at Canva. Um, we are we moved to DBT. I think towards like the end of last year or the beginning of this year and I kind of on like a pretty classic um, DBT snowflake five turn stack at the moment. Um, I come from a computer science background so uh, the idea of being able to use things like for loops or SQL was like really fascinating, the coolest thing ever to me. Uh, so um, that's been really cool and I've also kind of delved a bit more into the DBT code base and done a couple of contributions which was also really fun and neat. Um, and I think that's about it for me. Yeah, I think there's some exciting announcements with um, DBT Coalesce uh, coming up, the DBT conference that's, uh, is it in November or December, Vinci? Yeah, I think, I think it's in like the first or second week of December. Yeah, and so there's like a, a um, I think day four is in the Australian time zone. So that's one to watch. I think um, the team at Canva are, are, are hosting that one. So that's going to be awesome. I know, you know, Canva have uh, contributed quite a lot to the DBT open source project. So it's, it's awesome, you know, also to have such a, a great conference here in the Australian time zone as well. That's, that's awesome. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, obviously, we've live streamed to YouTube. Uh, we've got our data engineers uh, meetup Slack group. So happy to take questions here or on Zoom um, or via these two channels. Me and Vinci will keep an eye on on both of those. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. We've got like three awesome speakers. Hamza Khan, he's from Servian, uh, which are an awesome consultancy. Uh, sometimes I'm super jealous seeing all the certifications that a lot of their consultants seem to rack up in like six months. It just blows my mind how quickly they 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 do that. Uh, Dom Collier, he presented at uh, Data Inch Bytes, just an amazing uh, you know speaker. Let's face it, and um, he's got a pretty cool product announcement actually tonight. Um, and Sana Sanai, he's going to take us through the modern data warehouse. Um, from the Microsoft Azure perspective. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a great meetup full of some really good talks. And um, I think we're going to learn a bunch. But now I might just hand it over to um, Vinci to introduce our first speaker. 
Cool. So um, ASP has already talked a little bit about Hamza, um, talking at Serbian. So he has worked with quite a few clients with DBT. Um, and I guess in his free time, he walks his dog and plays with his dog, who is probably an extremely cute German Shepherd and Husky cross. And he probably needs to pay us dog tax eventually. <laughs> but I'll let him get started with his talk on um, how he's using BigQuery with DBT. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vinci. I'll just quickly share my screen and we'll just get started. Cool. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, that looks great. Cool. Awesome. So we'll get started. So today, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll be talking about BigQuery DBT uh, and I'll specifically be talking in this talk about how you can schedule your DBT jobs uh, using the serverless stack on Google Cloud Platform. So uh, first thing we'll talk about, we'll just touch a little bit on what DBT is and how DBT is useful in my experience. Um, and then we'll talk about how uh, you can orchestrate or you can run serverless scheduled jobs using DBT. So to get started, what is DBT? Uh, DBT is basically just an open source command line tool that helps you manage your data transformation. Um, it does the transformation bit in the ELT pipeline. And your function, its only function is a compiler and a runner. So essentially, it takes your code, compiles it to a syntax that BigQuery or other platforms can understand, and runs it for you. So you can think about it as you have your EL pattern or your ingestion pattern, where you've ingested a data into the raw layer of your, say, data set in BigQuery, and DBT kind of takes over, runs all your transformations, manages them, and then uh, you can have it in another data set, which then you can connect to, for instance, say business intelligence tool like Tableau or Luca or something. Now, so how does DBT help? So this is kind of like the six things that I think like we, I found the most useful when it comes to DBT. So starting off with the first thing is lineage. So you can utilize dynamic and parameterized table references. So use it usually in enterprise grade data warehouses, you have massive amount of objects in your warehouse and managing and handling lineage of all these objects can be really complicated. So DBT does a really great job in helping you manage these uh, lineages. The second one is trans uh, materialization. So you can choose the strategies, how you want to persist your objects in a data warehouse and everything is metadata driven. So if you want something as a view, as a table, or you want to partition or cluster your BigQuery table in a certain way, just to find it in the configuration and DBT handles that for you. The third cool thing that DBT provides, which I think is super important is testing. So DBT gives you a way of defining automated tests. So once you've built your models or your transformations, you can automatically also test them as well. The fourth thing is reusability. So DBT, what I really, really like about DBT is DBT gives you a lot of software engineering principles and practices in place. So one of them is reusability. So you will have a small DBT component called DBT macro, which you can basically use or define it, for instance, like a function, you can imagine it as a function Python, and then you can use that across many different transformations. The other thing is DBT, or the second last thing that I find really useful working with DBT day in, day out is your DBT seed. So if you have reference tables or slowly changing tables, you can persist them using CSV files, and DBT will again take that, those CSV files, persist them in the warehouse for you. And the sixth and the last feature, and I think this is probably the coolest feature that DBT has is the DBT documentation website. So literally DBT with a couple of commands, you can host a whole website where you not only have documentation about all your warehouse, all the models and your transformations, but it also shows you really cool visualization of how every single model in your DBT DAG is uh, connected together. So now we've kind of like looked at like a super high level overview of what DBT is. I'll jump into next of how you can schedule your DBT runs. So moving forward, running DBT in production. So as we know, DBT is a command line tool, um, but when you're running it in production, you need a system to run it on a schedule instead of running these commands manually. So there's many options that if you go through DBT documentation website as well, it gives you uh, options to use. If you're not using the open source version, if you're on DBT cloud, you can use DBT cloud to schedule your runs, or you can use, for instance, Airflow to do that, or you can use cron. Um, but in our, like the kind of work that we do, like a lot of our consultants, we love the serverless stack. So I'll talk about how you can do or schedule your DBT runs on Google cloud platform, but using the serverless stack. So, 
moving forward, the serverless tools that we'll use. So there's for the purpose of this talk, I've we're using three serverless tools within GCP to orchestrate or run uh, your DBT uh, DAGs. So the first one is Cloud Build. We'll use Cloud Build to deploy a service to Cloud Run. So Cloud Run is mainly will be hosting the service, and then once the service is hosted on Cloud Run, we'll use Cloud. Uh, we'll create a Cloud Scheduler job to run that service from Cloud Run. Going forward, some challenges. Uh, with using this stack. So first of all, Cloud Run expects a HTTP request. So as we know, dbt is a command line tool. Again, it's, it doesn't give you the H, a way to expose a HTTP endpoint for you to run. So for that, you need to uh, create a HTTP request in Cloud Run for it to run that. Since it's running in Cloud Run, again, you need a way to containerize your application or containerize dbt. And the third essential thing is how do you authenticate dbt with BigQuery? So when you're running it locally using commands, you can just use your credentials, but once you're on the cloud, then how do you authenticate dbt with BigQuery? So I'll be running a demo after the slide, I'll talk through the slides, and then in these slides, we'll go through each of these challenges, how you overcome them, and how everything looks like in Google Cloud Platform. Now, as I was, so primarily this talk was about how you can schedule using Cloud Run and Cloud Scheduler, but then as I was building uh, the code for the demo, I realized, oh, there's actually another way uh, that I think this can be done. And it's a little bit, in my opinion, is a little bit simpler than doing your Cloud Run and Cloud Scheduler, which is just using Cloud Build and Cloud Scheduler. So without the need of using Cloud Run, you can just use Cloud Build and a combination of Cloud Scheduler to or to run your jobs, dbt jobs on a schedule. So without further, I'll just jump into the demo now. Um, if there any questions, I can take them. If not, we'll just jump straight to the demo. Cool. So for the demo, I'll first walk through the code and then we'll look at how everything looks like in Google Cloud Platform. So. Uh, let's jump into the code. So this is kind of my uh, code. So for the first thing I'll walk you through is my dbt folder. So this has got all my dbt artifacts in it. It's a super simple dbt uh, project. So I'm making or I'm using the public uh, GCP BigQuery data sets table. So consider those or think about those as your source data sets. And then you have dbt that will handle all the transformations further down. So just to give you an example of the model, is this big enough or should I make it bigger? Cool. Maybe just, uh, yeah, just a touch bigger. Cool. It's not bad though. Is it getting bigger? I don't know. So you can make a window smaller as well here. We're sharing that window. Oh, don't worry about it if it's any hassle. It's fine. Yeah, it's a different screen, so. Okay, so uh, this is an example of one of the transformations that I'm using uh, for this demo. So it's a super simple, select a few fields uh, around some of the others and you're selecting from a particular source. And that source is like I mentioned is a public BigQuery data set. So if I go into my staging YAML file, this is where I'm defining all of my source data sets and tables where it's going to be selected from. And then I have other like transformations which are very similar to that one. So again, this one again, selects a few fields, round sums the others and selects from the source. So my super simple, this is my super simple dbt project. Now, in order to run this dbt project, one way could be you would go into your demand command line and then just go dbt run, for example, to run everything. But in order to like orchestrate it, I just created a very simple bash script. So what this bash script does is I define my project, where the repository is, where my profiles, uh, YAML file for dbt stored, and I run basically just like three commands, a dbt debug, a run and a clean command. So we have a dbt project in place. We have our bash script that can run these dbt commands. So the next step is like I was saying, one of the challenges is, hey, dbt is a command line tool. How do we run it in or give it, run it in cloud run such that we can run it over HTTP or we can provide HTTP requests to it. So for that, I built this super simple Flask app so in this Flask app, I just have a very super simple function. It calls this dbt bash script, and then uh, you can run, when you run this app, it hosts it on this on port 8080. 
So we have a bash script ready. We have a simple flask app ready. Now the third step or th second challenge that I mentioned before is how do you containerize your application or your whole DBT application? So for that, I wrote this Docker file. So this Docker file picks up again, uses the official DBT Fishtown analytics image. You copy all the contents. Then I have a requirement.txt file. In this, I'm defining my Python packages that I need to install. So flask is one of them. And then, yeah, and then essentially I just run this Python script. So now we have your dbt project, your bash script, your Flask app, uh, which gives you the HTTP uh, address. And then you have your uh, Docker file that can containerize your whole application. So we have all these in place. Now, the fourth step in order to deploy the service on Cloud Run is you can again use all G Cloud commands or do it from the console, but I decided to do it through Cloud Build. Uh, Cloud Build is essentially a useful CI/CD tool in the GCP stack that can help you do continuous, you know, development and deployment. So I have this YAML file, which basically builds your Cloud Build uh, steps. So the first step in my deployment is essentially I build the container from the Docker file that I have. I push this container into container registry, and then I deploy my service or Cloud Run service. So three steps. So we started with the so now we have everything that we need for the Cloud Run app. So we had the DBT project, we have the bash script, we have the app, we have the container and we deploy the container on Cloud Run as well. So our last step is Cloud Scheduler. So scheduling this service. So before that, I'll just jump into GCP and show you how it looks like in Cloud Build and Cloud Run. And then I'll jump back and show you how I created my Cloud Scheduler job. So, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, this is my first, so this is the other one that I was talking about. There's another way to do it. So I'll jump onto that later. So this is my first trigger. So this is my DBT cloud run trigger. Essentially what this does is it runs these steps and deploys my app uh, on cloud run. So I have this essentially service name, which I can change. So if I want to name this service, something different, I can just replace it over here. And it uses that um, cloud run YAML file that I've shown earlier. So if I just jump into the dashboard and show you how, if you run this so, uh, trigger in Cloud Build, if you go to this, you can see that the three steps are basically, the first one is you build your container using that Docker file, you push it to container registry, and then you deploy your app on Cloud Run. And then using these steps, it automatically gets deployed to Cloud Run. And this is my service that's up and running in Cloud Run. Uh, if I just jump and look at this service, you can see that it has a URL that I can hit and it would run that Flask app with my DBT bash script and it will run the whole DBT DAG for me. And then all artifacts will be then created in BigQuery for me. So we now have the cloud run. The final step in our uh, demo is how do we create a cloud scheduler job? So for that, I created again, a, another bash script. Bash is a lifesaver. So I created this bash script. Essentially what this does is I first create a service account. I give the service account a particular role so that it can invoke or run that cloud run service. And then I just create my cloud scheduler job, which runs every six hours. So every six hours, it's going to call that URL and that URL, like you saw before that cloud run gives me, it's just calling this URL every six hours. So if I jump to cloud scheduler, so you can see that this is my cloud run DBT scheduler job. This is the URL that we saw in cloud run and every six hours, basically it just calls this uh, cloud scheduler job. If I run this now, it doesn't fail, fingers crossed shouldn't fail. Um, I run this, you can see that it would run and it would create all the DBT artifacts in BigQuery. So if we want to see if everything's running properly, we can just go in cloud run, go into the logs. And what time is it? It's 5.49. We can see that just before 5.49, it, yeah, all this DBT runs started and ran. And if I go into BigQuery, you would see that you have these uh, within my DBT file, create all these models. These models are automatically created for me. 
cool so that's one way of doing it the other way like i was talking about is that when i was creating this demo i thought that there's probably another way of doing it as well which is just using cloud build and cloud scheduler so cloud build gives you a way of again gives you a way where you can call an api and that api is essentially also http uh gives you http address to call so you can just essentially use cloud build and then call that on a schedule so Let's look at that now. So I have a cloud build.yaml file and essentially the steps that I was running in bash script, which is dbt clean, debug run and dbt clean, I defined them as cloud build steps. And what I do after building these cloud build steps is I just call them from a cloud scheduler. So if I jump again into GCP and I open this dashboard, which is dbt cloud build, the three essential steps, which is dbt debug, again, dbt run and dbt clean. So essentially what I was doing in the bash script and creating the Flask app to run it in cloud run, I have those three steps in my cloud build uh, trigger. And if I just, again, manually run this trigger, what cloud run was doing, essentially cloud build is doing the same thing for me. I can go into the history. And if I just open the history, you can see that it's, you know, building this like, and then it would, yeah, it's pulling everything, it's building, and then it would run the dbt debug, then the run and then the clean command. So it's pulling everything from Fishdown Analytics official repo. I think it's build everything. And yep, so it just ran the dbt debug step now it's running the actual dbt step so it's creating all the models it's running everything and once it finishes everything then it'll run the cleanup step so you can run this again manually by running the trigger but then you can use cloud scheduler since cloud build gives you ability to uh, call the api using a http request you can essentially give that http request to cloud scheduler and let it call this cloud build or essentially what I did manually, it would do it on an automated scheduled way. So if I go to the bash script here, so you can see again, this bash script is very, very similar to the one that we had previously. The only difference is that you have a different URL. So I'm just calling this cloud build API. I provided the project ID where this is running and the trigger ID of that particular trigger that I just showed you. And again, the same steps follow. You create a service account, you give it a particular role that it can call that cloud build job, and then you create a cloud scheduler job. This time I just change it to every seven hours and you give this different URL to, for it to hit, which is this one here. Now, jumping again back to uh, the console. So if I show you the same job, which is over here, you can see that this is my cloud build DBT scheduler job and it's, almost the same. The only difference is this runs every seven hours and it's, it's got a different target URL to it. So if I run this again, it would do the same thing, uh, but it's just different uh, URL. So there's two ways that you can really schedule uh, your DBT jobs using Cloud Scheduler, Cloud Build and Cloud Run. Um, but yeah, I'll jump back to the slides now. Um, And yeah, that was the demo. And then if there are any questions, I'll just take any more questions. Awesome stuff, Hamza. That's uh, really cool. It's, um, we have had a couple of talks on um, Google Cloud, but we don't have often have a, a huge amount. So that's great. I think we've got a question come through from YouTube. Um, just asking, I guess, you know, why, why use cloud run, um, you know, if a cloud scheduler and cloud build trigger, you know, work well, um, I guess, you know, you probably explained like, you know, the yeah. two methods and stuff like that, but if you yeah. could provide a bit more commentary on that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can use traditionally, like you would use cloud run to create a service and then hit a service using HTTP, but then there's another way of doing it using cloud build, which is like I was saying, it's a more simpler and a better way to do it. So there's really up to you uh, how you wanna run it either in cloud build or cloud run, but 
I think using both methods, I think cloud build and the cloud scheduler way is the most simpler method to do it, a way to do it. Alan Watmail has come through on YouTube as well. Um, are there any benefits of using cloud build, uh, cloud scheduler over say GitHub Actions or GitLab CI? Um, no, I think they're both tools. So whatever tool or so certain clients that we work with, they, for example, cannot use, or they don't use cloud build, certain use GitHub Actions. So it just depends on what tool or stack that your company is on. And yeah, you can use either or. Yeah, I guess if you've got one particular build tool, yeah. you're probably going to go with that. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, what further steps, like a question from me would be what further steps would you take, um, you know, to say, you know, get something like this production, you know, like, I guess, you know, people talk about Google Cloud Composer, it's, it's a bit more expensive, I guess, enterprise customers are like, yeah, no worries, you know, happy to pay the thousands of dollars a month or whatever, but say startups a bit more cost conscious, you know, I guess, you know, you're pulling down an image from Docker Hub, from the Fishtown image yep. with cloud uh, build, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it, did you use the Google Cloud registry or, you know, could you use that or something like that? With cloud, well, you can, yeah, you can create a, you know, the same way that I did for cloud run, you can create a, uh, image and then push it to container registry and use that yeah but essentially when you like in the cloud build steps where i define hey like go into the fishtown analytics uh image and then pull that so it can do that for you as well yeah nice and uh the other question that i had was i guess the like the the, the cloud run example is really cool but you know um the like you know and I, I, you know, no criticism whatsoever, but, you know, I guess I, I get a little bit worried about perhaps rate limiting, you know, maybe if someone's just like, you know, hitting yeah. refresh on the browser, yeah. you have like 50 DBT or 50 billion DBT runs or something well, like that. Well, uh, yes, you would. If you have your cloud bill or cloud run service where it's not, it's unauthenticated. So if it's unauthenticated, people can hit that. But if you have, it as unauthenticated, then like the example, and I'll probably didn't talk a lot about it, but I should have, that when I build the cloud run service, this cloud run service does not allow any unauthenticated runs to it. So no one can sit there and hit that. And then when I create, <coughs> sorry, a cloud scheduler job for it, we create a specific service account and give it a role to say that, hey, this service account can be used to run this cloud run service. So you can't essentially sit like there. You need like authenticated access in order to run that cloud run service. So it should be okay for this example. Yeah, no, fair yeah. enough. No, yeah. yeah. No, it's just a just a worry that popped up in my head. So yeah. not a problem. Glad yeah. you it, thought of it. And it would go, it, it would happen the same thing for cloud build as well. So essentially if you want to trigger that, um, that endpoint or that URL, again, you need, that access or that those rights to hit that endpoint. You need the yeah. trigger ID and everything. So if you're controlling everything using service accounts and authentication, then it should be, it should be okay. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Yep. Well, thanks so much, Hamza. That was uh, really cool. Um, always great to you know, see how you can do things low cost on GCP to get, yep. you know, DBT up and running. Over to you, Vinci. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even ask Vinci, did you have any questions for Hamza? Um, I did not have any okay. questions. Yeah. Right, cool. So next up, we have Dom from Fivetran. So in his free time, he likes to play a Canadian ice sport called broomball, which I've been told is hockey, but an ice field. And I keep imagining someone running with like joggers on ice, which I feel like wouldn't be very productive. But anyway, he is secretly very talented at it and played in the world championships in Canada back in 2012. But I will let him go ahead and speak about his talk. Cheers, thanks, Vinci. Let me uh, share my screen as well. Uh, cool, I'll just check we can all see that. Cool, fantastic. 
Um, thanks for the intro. As been said, my name's Dom. I'm the, the senior sales engineer here at Five Churn in the Sydney office. Um, and, and we do have an exciting product announcement uh, that today that's going to drop in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's that we're going to integrate uh, DBT directly into Five Trend. Um, and we'll go through two ways of how we're going to do that. Uh, so as I said, two ways we'll integrate DBT with uh, transformations that we can run directly from Five Trend. Um, and then Five Trend is authoring DBT packages um, on the behalf of some of the connectors that we do have. So to put that into a, a little bit of context then um, of, of what is FiveTrain and how we're gonna orchestrate these DBT runs, um, we are a fully managed data pipeline as, as a service. Uh, so we require no maintenance, uh, no configuration, um, and essentially we are the E and the L uh, of the ELT piece. And we'll land all and centralize all that data into a cloud data warehouse for you, such as uh, Snowflake, Redshift, uh, and also BigQuery uh, and a few others. We, we essentially have in the business of connectors. So we have uh, around 200 native connectors now. And as you said, we're, we're all about just trying to help you centralize that data so you can spend your time in DBT uh, and build your cool models. Where we fit into that, I guess, in an architectural sense then is obviously we're gonna have a time source data that we need to uh, centralize. Five train is that pipe um, and we'll be act as that ingestion layer to put it into your warehouse, um, which then obviously DBT is gonna sit across. So like I said, two concepts that we'll, uh, we'll cover today. Uh, and the first one's gonna be DB2 transformations uh, within FiveTrend directly. So uh, it definitely looks like I stole this off Hamza, um, but <laughs> I didn't, I swear someone at head office gave me this. Um, in, in a kind of architectural sense, how that looks then, obviously, uh, as Hamza said, you're gonna have data loaders and FiveTrain is one of those data loaders. Uh, we're gonna land that raw data uh, into your data warehouse for you. And then obviously we know DBT is fantastic uh, at doing that transformation piece uh, and getting that data ready for the BI tools. Uh, so like Hamza said, one way you can obviously do that is definitely through uh, using those Google Cloud services uh, and FiveTrain want to kind of make it easy for our customer as well to kick those off and do them within FiveTrain. So how is that going to work? Uh, FiveTrain is going to connect directly to your DBT packages uh, in Git, for example. I believe we also have Bitbucket as well. Uh, and then we're going to essentially spin up a container on your behalf. We're going to load that in with whatever dependencies we need, fire off those jobs, uh, and then collect the output. So we have some reporting as well. Um, and that's how that, the integration is going to work. Uh, obviously, that gives us a lot of power then. Uh, we can have our DBT and our five trend logs together, and we can see what's happening with those pipelines pretty much all the way up to when the BI tool uh, takes them over. What's different in DBT then um, for FiveTrain? Uh, we have this one extra file, this deployment uh, YAML file. Uh, and what that gives is essentially uh, the schedules that FiveTrain is gonna kick off your, uh, your models on. So you can see here, we've got a, an example one. I'll show it in the demo. It's got three jobs, a daily, a nightly, and a weekly, uh, and obviously kicking off different models. Uh, these are cron schedules at the moment, um, and very soon we'll kick, have the ability to kick them after our pipes finish. So we can land data, instantly kick off our DBT packages and not have to worry about our timing windows and making sure nothing's gonna overlap, which is, uh, which is always fun. The second point uh, that we have is uh, around our DBT packages. So as I said, we're integrating with DBT so we can use it directly in the UI. And we're also authoring packages um, with DBT. So, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with the package is essentially we have models um, that you can you can download off the DBT hub, um, completely open source uh, and free. And because FiveTrain lands those uh, normalized schemas, uh, we obviously know exactly what that scheme is gonna be every time. So we can build a reliable little code set on top of it. Uh, and this is gonna be about modeling data and also some macros there in some of them as well. So, so I jumped ahead of slide, but like I said, we land on anomalized schemas, um, which then lets us be able to reuse those schemas and kind of produce common data models um, to give you. At the moment, they're all supported on Redshift, BigQuery, and Snowflake. And you can see a few of our packages that we've got there. Uh, and there's a whole host uh, of ones coming up. So today we'll show the five-turn log connector. Uh, we'll show a little example about how you can use a DBT package to, to look at what's happening in five FiveTran and your pipelines. So uh, who's interested in FiveTrain DBT packages and why we've built them? So the two main use cases where we're seeing at the moment and, and the requests that we got for this were 
customers who have just added one of our connectors, let's say a Salesforce or an Asana or, or Facebook ads, and they haven't read any transformations yet, and they kind of want to get a head start. So we can give them some base reporting um, kind of tables or views, and then they can take those. They might serve uh, some customers exactly what they need. Happy days, we can go straight to the BI layer, or you can take them as a base and start tweaking them. Uh, the other ones we have are analysts um, who have already had some information, sorry, some transformations in place. Um, and again, they can use us as a kind of a template or a benchmark. Uh, and also they get the stuff around the documentation, running the automated test on Fivetran, uh, and enriching those with, with, it, with our features. So like I said, we have uh, those ones that I showed before and I'll show them again at the end. Um, we have a few more in development. Uh, Mixed panel Shopify have, have been two biggest ones we've had requested. Uh, and then you can see on our roadmap. So we're trying to get these out. Um, I believe it's like one or two uh, every fortnight. Uh, so they're coming out pretty quick. Um, Facebook, Jira, Google Ads, uh, the ones that kind of going to drop next uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. So concepts over, let's have a demo. Everyone loves a demo. Uh, and we'll see how it looks. So this is Fivetrend. Um, and we'll do it, we'll add a quick connector uh, to set the context of how we can get that data in. So as I said, Fivetrend is all about getting the data from sources into your data warehouse um, as quickly and reliably as possible. So I've got a Snowflake data warehouse up here. Um, pretty much a one-off setup here. We've got a, a host name, username and password, and we have a data center in Sydney, which is great for our data sovereignty. But really the crux of where Fivetrend is, it's connectors. So we have a whole bunch of connectors here you can see I've set up. Um, and we'll go through and quickly whack a Salesforce on. We'll give this a unique name. It's gonna be ad for our DBT demo. And we'll authorize. So this will go off and do an OAuth stream, log us into Salesforce. We use Okta, so it's gonna be a single sign on for me. Uh, if not, it would be your standard username and password. We can see that succeeded, happy days. We'll save and test. Um, that'll check we have access to the API uh, and then create that connector for us. Hopefully it's not gonna play out for me while we're demoing. Um, the main, I guess the main kind of groups of connectors that, that Fivetrend has, we obviously have SaaS applications, uh, such as your Salesforce, your NetSuite, Shopify's, uh, Facebook, Google Ads. Um, we also support databases, whether they're running in the cloud or on-prem, um, we can hit all your standard SQL, oracles, uh, Postgres, uh, and the likes, and then files and events as well. So you can see that's created a, a Salesforce schema, uh, sorry, a Salesforce connector for me. We're gonna quickly choose a schema. Um, and this is gonna load all the tables and custom objects we have uh, inside Salesforce. So I'm just gonna save and test that. We're gonna pull everything. Um, you can pick and choose which you want uh, and don't want. And then you kick off a sync. So that would load all our Salesforce data for, through for us uh, into Snowflake. And then we can do some DBT transformations on top of it. So if we jump to DBT, uh, you can see I've got some up and running uh, for the demo here. But if we jump into the configure tab, this is how we'll link, as I said, to our Git repository. So this is the first way uh, of how we integrate with DBT um, uh, and get that in right so we can orchestrate it directly from, from Fivetrain. So you can see we've got a public key. You're gonna have to add that as a deployment key in your GitHub. Um, so obviously I've done that. This is the little GitHub I've spun up for this, um, where my DBT packages are located. Uh, and then a schema name. So we're gonna have a schema name where we're gonna put this inside Snowflake. We save and test that. Um, and that's gonna create our jobs that we have here. So like I said, we have that deployment file. Um, and if I show it what that looks like quickly, you can see this is the GitHub that I connected to. We've got our new deployment file here, and this is the file specifically for Fivetran. So we have a look at that. We've got two jobs, daily and weekdays, as we saw. I've set up daily to run every half an hour, uh, and I'm just running all the models I've got here and there at the moment. And obviously this can be any DBT command that is going to be valid. Excuse me. Uh, similar for weekdays, um, this is gonna run at 7.30 on every weekday. So nothing really uh, crazy different here, just your cron schedules and obviously whatever steps that you're gonna normally run in DBT. How that looks then as we put it in, as we said, we can sync from GitHub. It's just another sync a couple of seconds ago. 
and that is going to containerize those jobs for you on on the schedule that you fix so 30 minutes in this instance uh it's going to run those into into snowflake in this instance um and it's going to spit back our output so similar as we saw in hamza um the logs that we're going to get back from dbt we can see we've run, run a bunch of packages here all around our five trend log connector um and then we can go and see what that looks like in snowflake so as i said we have a free connector um our five train log connector and this collects all your information about what's happening in five trains so when your pipes have run obviously the log your account what destination you're running to and what transformations we jump into snowflake quickly we can see here we've got uh, all our landed data from those connectors we showed before uh, and now we've got that dbt demo schema so I open up that we'll have a look um, and if we look at for example our connector history Sorry, before I jump in here, let me show what that looks like as a package. So this is one of the packages that uh, Fivetran has authorized and we'll show you how to get another one uh, in a second. So like I said, it will create some models for you uh, and similar in kind of DBT, we'll just get those SQL scripts. So these are some pre-built ones. Uh, we've got some staging ones as well. Now if I have a quick look, nothing kind of too drastic here, just some basic uh, SQL to join a few of those uh, five trend log connector tables together um, and get some start dates of when our syncs have run uh, and if they're actually still running uh, and they're not broken. So some good stuff we can do for kind of an ETL framework or an ETL pipelining dashboard report. So the output of that, as I said, if we look at the uh, connector status table, for example, so we can see we've got a bunch of connectors here. We've got some sales forces, uh, some zeros, some ones that are running. Um, and this one we might be able to put into an ETL dashboard that we have up so we can check, make sure all our pipes are up and running. We've seen got a few broken, uh, they've been for, paused. We've got a couple here running on a schedule. We can see the time they last sync uh, when they set up. Uh, and then I've forced one to break. So if we did get an error on the five trend side, uh, then we can start seeing those errors directly uh, and not having to go back to five trend, we can have all our logging in one place. So. I changed the IP address of a little uh, Postgres instance I was running. And we can see Pipetrain's gonna pipe uh, with DBT, gonna pipe those errors through to Snowflake for us. So um, a pretty simple example, uh, but I think it's also pretty useful. You always need to, uh, to watch and manage what's going along in your pipelines, also in your data warehouse. Um, and that's how Fivetrain can help uh, orchestrate that. If we jump back to Fivetrain for a sec, again, it's always nice in demos when everything worked nice and perfectly, but in the real world, things are gonna fail eventually. Uh, and this is what it'll look like if a DBT package fails uh, for some reason, then we'll also capture those errors as well. So you can see here, this one's been failing. We can drill through, uh, it's kicked off some, they have pretty much all errored, uh, and we've just got a privilege error to be able to write those transient tables. So obviously, again, trying to make sure we uh, keep track of everything that's happening inside Fivetran, inside your DBT packages, have that all in one place. Um, so we can get some good insights out of that. And obviously that includes porting those error messages back and forth. So that's how uh, we integrate uh, with DBT. So we can help kick off those jobs for you. Um, this is in private preview at the moment um, and it should be launching uh, I think either end of this week or end of next week. So sometime before the end of the month, this should be up and running uh, in general availability. Now, the second uh, way that we're, we're kind of integrating with DBT, as I said, is through uh, these packages. So on the DBT website, uh, you can see here, Fivetran is authorizing a bunch of packages. And why this is possible is, as I said, we, we normalize the schemas we get from our sources. Um, uh, which means they're always going to be the same when we land them in your destination, whether you're using Redshift, uh, Snowflake, BigQuery, those schemas are going to be the same. So we can have a predefined starting point to do some, some basic kind of common data models on top of them. You can see there's a bunch here um, and a bunch more on the way. So how you would interact with these, as you saw, we saw the five trend log connector. Um, let's say we wanted to get uh, a Stripe as well. You can see there's just a, a package you need to grab. And if I jump over, I've got my packages file uh, ready. You can see I've got the log and the Pinterest one in here. So we're gonna add Stripe in. 
we'll close that. Obviously, you'll need to connect your Stripe connector up in Fivetran first uh, and land that data. So plug and play to land the Stripe data. We're going to whack that in there. And then if I grab my terminal, hopefully this works. We'll run the dvt command. Uh, and that will go and grab our Stripe package for us. So that's going to grab uh, what we've worked with with Stripe and obviously with dvt. Um, and it's going to pull down those files for you. Uh, if we have a little look in our dvt modules. Cool, we've got some Stripe ones. Okay, same with the models. Um, uh, and this track one, we've got some daily overviews. We had some invoice line items, uh, some monthly overviews, quarterly, a few different breakups there, um, and probably balanced transactions. So again, pretty much most companies uh, who are going to be using Stripe are probably going to go to want some variation of those kind of reporting layer uh, objects. Um, and we just want to kind of help out. We're going to help out streamline that data ingesting into Snowflake uh, and then streamline that again to get to those reporting level models so we can go straight to a BI tool. We can show our business users or our execs um, uh, that, that quick delivery, we should be able to get this up into a sprint, get that champion buy-in and then continue on with the rest of the project. Um, and that's uh, that, that's really all I've got. Um, that's the, the new kind of announcement we've got. We're pretty excited about it. We're hoping uh, it's going to be uh, pretty valuable to, to our customers who are already using dbt uh, and then hopefully anyone looking into it, maybe anyone doing POCs, some way you can really uh, streamline those POCs and, and get that speed to insights. That was awesome, Dom. I think uh, that's that's really cool. I guess now you can sort of orchestrate DBT using Fivetran. That's kind of, I guess, you know, the big announcement. Would it be fair to say? Yeah, that sure is. That's the big one. Uh, one of many, but yeah, that's the big one for DBT. So yeah, hopefully that's... it's getting other people as excited as we are about it. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through on the YouTube channel. These are really uh, juicy ones. So one from uh, Berger Hafmeyer. Um, as your sources evolve, um, it's a bit on schema evolution, I guess, uh, kind of uh, similar to your talk at Data Range Bytes. Yeah. Um, you know, you add more attributes and stuff like that, target staging schemas, and thus your DBT templates may need to evolve. Um, how are you planning to support this? Is, you know, I guess like Fivetran is going to handle that for you, I'm pretty sure. But I guess, do you have to manually update DBT or? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, like this is pretty new. So obviously in the future, we might be able to streamline this a bit more and, uh, and our product team is heavily working on it. But as you said, but yeah, definitely with Fivetran, we'll handle all the schema migration for you. We'll add new columns when they get added to your source, uh, new tables, et cetera. How that will work with the dbt packages that we author we'll keep those up to date on the dbt website so you'll just have to pull down the new package um, and obviously we'll get some comms out whenever we do make those updates if you've gone and tweaked that package then or you've built your own package on top of five trend tables uh obviously if that schema changes then yeah you're definitely gonna have to update your dbt packages um but in our logs we have a few um events that tell you when a scheme has changed so you could put some listeners on those events um, yeah. and that will at least give you a notification when you need to start that project piece. And I guess, yeah, so going back to it, say the uh, five trans stripe package, I guess, is going to be updated, generally speaking, in line with any sort of schema changes coming from Stripe. If um, I'm guessing might might have been Berger's uh, follow up question to that. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, the ones that we author um, on DBT, so pretty much the ones on the on the website, uh, if they change, obviously we're going to have to make the API changes on our end, change your schemas when they land your data. And yeah, we'll definitely keep these ones up to date. So you'll just have to make sure you download that package again. Yeah, nice. Um, so Alan Watmel, um, he's asked, how does Fivetran handle formula fields in Salesforce? That's one big issue I, find I have with uh, Stitch. I guess Stitch is another product in this space. Uh, the Salesforce formula fields aren't automatically recalculated. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you might have stopped me on that one. I believe, um, and I might have to follow up with you on this one, but I believe they get wrapped up with our custom uh, columns. So we'll pull all custom objects through on Salesforce as we go. Uh, and then obviously if there's any data change, uh, our data capture will grab that from that custom column. So I believe they're, they're, they're wrapped bundled into the custom columns, um, but I can definitely follow up with you and check on that. 
Yeah, cool. I, I believe Alan's on our Slack, so I'll I'll make an introduction. Sounds like it's a bugbear of his. Um, yeah, just one question from me. Just you know, like um, you know, I you know I've used Fivetran about three years ago, and it was like it's such a fantastic tool because it's quick to um, onboard a lot of data. But I guess you know some people might be very new to Fivetran. I guess you know, you know, with all the connectors and stuff like that, I guess, what's the value? I guess, you know, if I were to answer that question, you know, being able to onboard Stripe data and Braintree data and different sort of sources like from SaaS apps really quickly without having to build up those connectors yourself, I guess, would that be fair to say that's kind of the big value add? Yeah, for sure. That is definitely probably one of our biggest value adds. I mean, I'm sure everyone on on the webinar knows that building pipelines is is, is difficult, especially if we're talking about SaaSs and APIs. Uh, and once you get all that data into your database or your data warehouse, then you've got a whole another stream of work to do to curate that data, build that database architecture, and then you're reporting. So I mean, there's a they're big projects, and there's a lot of things, and there's the maintenance obviously that goes around with that when pipelines change. Um, where Five Trend helps, and yeah, our value add is we can take that piece of work away from you. You can concentrate on your database layer, your BI tools and get that insights for your business. Moving that data doesn't really add a ton of value for them. So we can definitely help on that, free up some of your time um, and obviously make it reliable and, and kind of zero touch from there on out because you won't have to go back and maintain those pipelines. Yeah, cool. That's, uh, thanks for that. Um you know, it's, it's just good. It's, you know, even if it sounds a bit sales pitchy, it's, it's just good to understand, like, cause of, you know, I've found particularly five trans, uh, a pretty handy tool in terms of getting a lot of velocity. So, uh, thanks for sharing that over to you, Vinci, any, um, any questions or anything like that? Yeah, actually I had one question. So I noticed that there were quite a few like DBT packages for a lot of like marketing platforms or like there are some like there and some coming out so like being ads or like google ads and facebook ads and i think like the schemas for these are mostly normalized like you've mentioned um but one thing i feel like marketers often ask is they want to like know the same metrics so like something like cost per impression or like a cost per acquisition across like all platforms and then also be able to split them um one thing as an analyst I found is like modeling this can be really annoying because all these different like platforms call them like very different things, even though like they're the same thing. So I'm wondering if like whether it's on a roadmap um, or something where it's possible to kind of union all these data sources already and to kind of already create like a unified view um, of what is essentially the same data from multiple different sources. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, yeah, and like kind of industry specific data models uh, for like a marketing campaign analytics. Um, I, yeah, like I said, this is pretty new. Our product team is really excited about it, So I definitely think it will go down that space. Um, obviously, not, nothing official yet, but there's definitely been some chatter internally of how uh, we can help out of how to join these data sets together. So with like the five trend log connector, we can give you a table to say, hey, if you need to join Facebook ads to Google ads, this is a unique key you can use across those sets. So we're definitely exploring those kind of options um, to help streamline this. Um, uh, and yeah, I think industry specific models will, will probably be a kind of a generic evolution of that as we go down. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really, it was really nice to like hear about what's going on with 5 and We totally love it as well. My pleasure. Great to hear. Cool. Um, so next up we have Sana, who is a solution specialist at Microsoft. So he's quite an interesting person. He's got a lot of interest. So he's into soccer um, and also cricket, but also into kind of more creative, like writing like poetry. Um, I think he's also like probably one of those people uh, who was into data before data was cool. So I'm really excited to be hearing about his talk on like how data warehousing has changed and, and how what it's like in the modern era. So over to Sana. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinci. Um, hi, everyone. So let me share my screen. Yep, you've got it shared. Just got to maximize okay. your yep. slides. Oh, I think we've got the presenter view. Oh, okay. Uh, that's the charm of, uh, I think, uh, having two different screens. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, let me see if this time it works. No. No, no. I think. Uh, let me just. I was presenting, I think, at the Melbourne AWS meetup, and um, I was like. It was using Skype and I was really struggling to, I think, you know, there was a permissions error or something like that. And, um, and yeah, I think my, my Mac was going a bit haywire. Oh, now it's working, but yes. So <laughs> yeah. I cannot judge at all. I, I've, I've right. had the same yeah. struggles, but I'll, I'll let you get to it. Okay. Awesome. So I, I think, yeah, uh, as Vince mentioned, I've, I've been, um, involved with the data when it, it wasn't too much uh, cool at that time, in especially the AI and, and machine learning as well. Uh, but I, I just wanted to uh, take you guys on a journey uh, how the data warehouses uh, we morphed into data lakes discussions and how did the um, modern data warehouse era um, is dealing with all these uh, discussion around um, do we have, uh, do we need a data warehouse or do we need to have a data lake? or even uh, we'll, we'll explore uh, about the data lake houses as well that we have been starting to listen about. So uh, I think as a data engineer as well, uh, the way I want to connect with the community, um, uh, being a uh, protect practitioner myself as a consultant, I, I think our, our mission is more to find out the order out of the chaos. So all the data that we are uh, dealing with, um, the, all the data that we see from different sources, how do we bring that um, to an order so that we can make some sense out of it? So I think that's the quest that we um, as a practitioner, as a data engineer, uh, or as an analyst, uh, we um, uh, envision that uh, state where we have everything in order and then we can uh, get some analytics and then uh, uh, insights out of it. And it's a reality that we are uh, bombarded with uh, data sources um, uh, all over the place. We have uh, all dif different sources um, as you have seen with uh, DBT and, and Fivetran, like uh, you, you need to have um, a lot of these data connectors for any tool that you want to ingest data. Um, and that data reality, um, actually we need to understand how we um, came to this state, um, how, what, what was the evolution uh, so when we started. So I'll, I'll start with that uh, journey. Uh, we had this uh, database management systems concept uh, in, in the 70s and 80s. It evolved and then we started having those discussions and then we had those bigger players around the data warehousing around the 80s and 90s. So that was the time it was the uh, market was uh, getting hot in terms of that competition. Uh, and we had those oracles and DB2s and then um, teradatas of this world who were uh, more incumbent in that position uh, and they were the main players in the data warehouse space. Um, as we uh, moved um, more into that uh, space and, and we were getting more data sources coming along, we could see that uh, the, the bigger players, um, they were uh, more getting a, a, a bit slack in terms of the innovation that we were seeing around those uh, data warehouse uh, domains. Um, and, and, and with the uh, enormous uh, expansion of the data that we have seen in the web space as well as with the social media, uh, we could see that the demands of uh, managing the data and, and we often talk about all these uh, four or three or five Vs, uh, but, but uh, even if you have to name four of them, it's the velocity, volume, variety, or veracity, and sometimes you top it up with value as well. So all these Vs that we wanted to um, take care about, um, we, we as an industry, we, we saw uh, uh, so much potential in, in the Hadoop uh, open source project that uh, it might be the platform where uh, it could be uh, cheaper, it could be faster, as well as uh, it can manage the economies of the scale for us to manage uh, all, all this data. And, and, and we, we can make sense out of uh, this enormous expansion that we are uh, seeing in the industry. Um, so that was the movement where um, these bigger players, they, uh, they felt the disruption in the market uh, with Hadoop coming to the space. Uh, and, and that was the time from uh, from its uh, start around 2006. So we, we could see that 
market has been um, trending towards that uh, do we need to have a data lake so that we can capture all this big data um, and then maybe combine it with a data warehouse or do we need to have a data warehouse um, uh, or, or instead of uh, a data lake, or do we morph into, or we migrate or offload the data warehouse into a data uh, lake? So I, I think the, all these discussions were happening. Uh, a lot of uh, companies ventured into um, creating data lakes, uh, but the reality uh, was that some of these missteps that we have seen, uh, considering that um, the offload of data warehouse into a data lake where you have a structured data sets, and you are moving into a semi-structured and non-structured space, uh, which doesn't have those capabilities of asset compliance and, and venture into that space. And then you try to get those uh, similar kind of tools like the SQL kind of tools to query the data. So that was the challenge that we found ourselves in. Um, also, there were max, uh, a lot of these security concerns uh, around the whole framework and the ecosystem around uh, Hadoop. Um, as well as um, I think when we had those discussion around the data lakes, um, a lot of traction was moving towards the more uh, newer project around Spark, uh, which was established as a de facto processing engine um, in, in, in the big data space. So, so that, that, that's um, all what we have been uh, seeing across that time around uh, 2016. So we had those bigger players, we were th which were threatened by all these unicorns based on the Hadoop framework and the Apache uh, projects. But also these newer player also started, uh, I think they had a kind of an infinite game that they didn't have to actually dismantle the bigger players, but they also had to uh, compete with each other as well. Um, and uh, having these, uh, the next phase, which actually uh, was uh, really interesting and, and we are still going through that phase, it was the cloud wars. And, and, and it was a rush to actually uh, go to the cloud uh, who can go um, as quickly to the cloud. So the customers were definitely interested in that whole economies of the scale that cloud brings in. And, and, and we have been talking about all these Snowflake and, and GCP and AWS uh, even in the previous talks as well. So, so that whole cloud rush that which uh, platform can actually take the customers quickly to the cloud that became the main uh, driver uh, in, in the whole industry. Um, and this um, ventured into the modern data warehouse architecture where we see uh, that the modern data warehouse doesn't have to be an exclusive decision around either you need a data warehouse or a data lake, but it has to be a combination of both of them. You, you can't just rely on either the structured data or the unstructured data, but you need to deal your data as a strategic asset for these uh, companies and, and, and for the customer, um, you, how do you combine and, and break those silos between those two platforms? That, that, that's the main uh, goal of when we call the modern data warehouse. Um, and, and we are seeing a lot of these um, terms now coming up, which is a data lake house. Um, again, a combination of both of them with some uh, bits and bobs around it. And, and, and we'll see uh, how does it relate. So that's the um, kind of a summary of a journey what we have seen in the industry going from a completely structured relational data sets moving towards how we combine that with the unstructured uh, and semi-structured data sets and uh, combine with the whole movement towards the cloud, which enables all this innovation. Um, again, we have uh, seen the innovation and disruption coming in from the open source uh, space uh, in terms of the Hadoop, Spark, and, and, and many other projects. Um, and, and that's the, Right now, we are at this stage where we are venturing into the modern data warehouse or data lake house uh, capabilities. So just a brief uh, background uh, in terms of uh, in, in our traditional um, data warehouse, when I when I started in the in, in the industry, it was more either Inmon and, and Kimball. So that was the uh, main fight that we were saying, which model do we need to um, uh, lean on to? Um, and both had their different pros and cons. They, they are still valid. And, and these uh, two guys are called the fathers of the data warehouse uh, world. 
And, and then we had all these discussion and use cases around data lakes uh, with data warehouse, which one makes sense uh, and, and where. Um, and then data lakes um, started to be more positioned towards a, a staging and, and the preparation layer uh, of these uh, models. Um, data scientists wanted to get their hands dirty with the whole uh, raw data uh, that were um, given to them. Uh, and it was more, um, optimized for the streaming uh, and, and, and mini batch uh, scenarios as compared to the low latency requirements uh, which uh, data warehouses um, can manage uh, much better. As an MPP platform, you have more capabilities in data warehouse to do those complex joins as compared to the data lakes. Um, so, so all these uh, different um, use cases that, that we have seen uh, getting established, but I, I think in terms of a general rule we'll see like as when we need to capture um, both the structured data and the semi-structured and unstructured data we need a combination of both of them it's, it's never a decision between either and or uh, but they should be complementing with each other uh, now the other uh, challenge when we face that when we have established uh, that we needed both of these platforms uh, a lot of organizations even in australia um, one of the larger ones uh, when they ventured into creating both these platforms, there are massive challenges that you feel uh, that, that you face uh, in terms of the security and compliance, in terms of all these configuration, in terms of all the tool set that you have to configure to make sure that they are working. Um, I'll give you a simple examples, like even as a data engineer, if you want to do those pipelines, uh, you need specific security and then the configuration that you need to set up for the data lake, and then you move on to the da uh, data warehouse, and it's a uh, complete whole set of new configuration that's there. Um, similar to the data scientist portfolio as well, um, all these configuration, those uh, role-based access controls, those those monitoring and um, uh, operations that you have to manage, um, it's a massive challenge that the organization face at this moment uh, in, in, in dealing these two platform as, as independent platforms. Um, and, and there are massive uh, other reasons not to go uh, with Hadoop as data warehouse because that's what we have seen in the industry. All those um, visions around that Hadoop is ready for being a data warehouse. I, I think that's a misaligned uh, consumption in, in my view, in, in my practice as well, I've seen a lot of organization venture into that direction and, and they have failed miserably, miserably because Hadoop itself uh, or the open source uh, framework itself is not meant for those use cases. Um, um, and, and we have seen the cloud wars as well that uh, we see. Um, now, the question is what makes sense uh, and, and when to choose which platform? Uh, for, for me, the guidance uh, which I follow is that uh, when we are deciding on a specific platform um, or even for a cloud vendor, uh, or any uh, platform which is enabling those two concepts around a data lake or data warehouse, or even a modern data warehouse, you need to uh, in, uh, think about investing in a platform, not just a simple shiny tool that you can get and, and it, it can get a few things done, but you should think about a platform. I'll, I'll give you some examples from my experience, like when we were um, in, back in those days, in the data warehousing days, you would think about a specific platform which would just do the data warehousing, but you then need the data engineering part for, for a specific tool. Then you need a specific tool for uh, BI, uh, business intelligence. You need a specific tool for um, source control. Um, so all these tools that when you have to align them together, uh, that uh, falls into my next point that you need to prefer the integrated capabilities. Um, so all, you need to avoid these uh, a lot of these moving parts. Um, so any environment or any platform which is giving you that whole unified experience, I think that's the best bet that you can do in terms of uh, uh, materializing the vision of modern data warehouse. Um, and, and the next part is, as I mentioned, the whole journey and the whole vision that the whole industry has towards this space, uh, and especially for data engineering, is that how fast we can move to get the value out of the data uh, and how fast we can actually get that chaos into the order. Um, and, and it also follows uh, one of the points that I made 
that we need to break those silos between those data, data platform. Either this is between the personas of a data engineer or a data scientist and a data analyst, uh, but also between the platforms uh, itself as well. Uh, Multi-cloud is, 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 is a wrong answer in, in many ways uh, for a modern data warehouse uh, concept, uh, not just from the data uh, estate, but also from the identity. And then and, and I'll quote uh, some of the other practitioner who, who follow this um, kind of mindset in terms of the multi-cloud strategy for specifically for a data estate. Um, again, uh, the platform, it has to enable the self-service or an enterprise BI, both the top-down or bottom-up approaches uh, and, and we definitely love uh, the native uh, or a first party integration of an open source uh, innovation if, if we can bring up bring it up DevOps is always a must and and, and we need to be cognizant of that um, the AI leadership uh, uh, AI and machine learning uh, use cases they they are so much relevant for the data uh, space and, and modern data warehouse lights them up so so we need a platform where we would be uh, seeing that whole AI leadership uh, in, in, in that uh, platform. With this, this is uh, just uh, uh, some quotes from the last week in AWS. Uh, um, the guy, he mentioned that uh, uh, multi-cloud is the wrong answer. So you, you can go and, uh, go and do some reading. Uh, this brings me to uh, um, in, in discussion like why um, Azure uh, above any other platform uh, Microsoft Azure has this ability that we have all these tools uh, which enable the time to X, which, which is bringing that whole time to value much more faster uh, as compared to months or weeks. Uh, you, you can do those tasks, uh, even the data engineering tasks in, in a few days, uh, if, if not weeks. We, we bring in that whole innovation around data and AI and ML, uh, not just in the hyperscale cloud, but even to the tactical edge. And you have all the uh, capabilities. You, you can bring in your open source frameworks and tools and any language of choice, um, we, we are open Open, uh, to any of them and, and, and bring in that experience of um, billions of devices from those telemetry of devices, we get uh, the leading security and privacy compliance uh, throughout that uh, platform. Um, jumping on to how do we materialize the modern data warehouse uh, vision, um, you could see that uh, for all these different layers, we have specific uh, tools uh, that how do we, we started with that vision around modern data warehouse. Uh, and, and we had a bunch of tools around ingest, prepare, and transform, and then serve layer, and even the visualization layer. Um, but where we have been innovating uh, lately for, for, from the last year is that we have Azure Synapse Analytics, which is an ecosystem of uh, all these different uh, capabilities that are required to build that modern data warehouse uh, or even a data lake house. Um, it, it stitches together all these different um, services uh, that, that you bring in, uh, going from the unified storage layer um, to all the data engineering uh, um, pers uh, persona. Um, you, you can have the experience of going from a no code, uh, low code experience to a code first experience as, as a data scientist. Um, and then uh, we bring in the best of uh, the Power BI capabilities integrated into that whole ecosystem uh, for you. And, and, and again, as I mentioned, the last step where uh, this whole ties into the AI and machine learning cap capabilities that um, Azure is uh, investing in, and we have Azure Machine Learning and Azure Databricks uh, for all these compute requirements for your AI and machine learning workloads. Uh, the way we have been innovating, especially for uh, with Azure Synapse Analytics is, um, you, you could see that whole modern data warehouse vision from different other vendors like AWS, and you can see a bunch of all these different uh, tools and capabilities across these different layers of, uh, of the whole data platform. Uh, similarly, you see those reference architecture from uh, GCP. Uh, again, a lot of these different uh, tools that you have to stitch together to make sure that you um, establish that modern data warehouse. Similar kind of a reference architecture that you see from Snowflake, uh, although like they have, they have been building a lot of these different tools, but primarily they have been the more of a data warehouse uh, capability uh, at the core. 
where uh, we have innovated with Synapse is we had the similar kind of a reference architecture where we have multiple different capabilities for ingest, store, processing, uh, modeling, and serve, and, and AI and, and machine learning. But what we bring in uh, the innovation with uh, Azure Synapse Analytics is that all these capabilities are now uh, already unified into a single platform, which covers all the uh, personas from the data engineers, data scientists, and data um, um, analysts. And, and, and it combines best of uh, all the um, worlds uh, already configured uh, so that you can get maximum out of the platform. Um, as you can see for ingest, we have uh, the pipelines that you can create with data flows as well as with Azure Data Factory. You have a storage layer, a, a, a petabyte scale storage layer with um, ADLS Gen 2, uh, which is uh, HDFS compliant uh, and it's the most performant uh, storage that you get on Azure. Um, in terms of the processing, uh, we have been innovating uh, and that's the uh, area where we bring down those silos between the relational and the non-relational world. We have um, Synapse SQL uh, uh, pools where you have a serverless capability as well to do those SQL queries on demand. Um, and you have a provisioned uh, capability where you have a data warehouse where you require it uh, uh, to be uh, up and running for most of the time you have a provisioned uh, pool um, in, in the Synapse SQL. And, and then we integrate those uh, goodness of open source uh, world where we have Synapse Spark uh, engine that uh, for all the data scientists and, and um, transformation and data wrangling kind of workloads, you can plug in into the Synapse Spark pools. Um, and and um, similarly for the model and serve, uh, these uh, pools can be used. And then we um, also, uh, from the uh, business intelligence point of view, we have uh, AI enabled uh, capabilities uh, with massive uh, amount of visuals from Power BI, which is the leading um, business intelligence tool for the last seven years in the Gartner uh, and then Forrester uh, quadrants as well. So this brings me um, to uh, one of the demo that uh, I can just uh, quickly sh uh, show you um, to give you an experience around the Azure Synapse Studio. Um, and and uh, before I do that, I, I can uh, quickly um, show you what, what's uh, inside a Synapse. Uh, as I mentioned, it combines um, all different runtimes for SQL as well as Spark uh, for these massively parallel processing capabilities that you require for an MPP platform. Um, you have the um, uh, different form factors, as I mentioned, you could have a provision as well as on-demand capabilities uh, or, or serverless capabilities, and you can uh, bring in any framework or a language of your choice. You can have SQL, Python, .NET, Java, Scala, or R uh, in, into that notebook experience as well. Um, and, and again, going from a very uh, code um, first experience as a data scientist to a code free experience in, in terms of the data flows and pipelines that you can create through Synapse. I'll just have a brief um, intro um, where I'll just show you the demo of the Synapse uh, Studio. So if you can see my screen. Um, if you can see the screen, uh, I come from a, a time where uh, we had to change multiple different um, uh, screens to, to get, uh, do the ingestion and then uh, exploration or do the analysis. But if you can see uh, on the screen, um, the Synapse Studio, it brings in all those capabilities in the single pane of glass uh, for you. Um, it starts with um, the data hub, uh, where you have all your databases, all your connection to different databases, either they are cloud-based or on-premises one. You can link them up. As you can see, I have all my storage accounts, my Cosmos DB, my uh, Azure Data Lake Store, uh, and other integration data sets. You can have, uh, we have multiple different connectors for uh, different um, other capabilities like um, this one is for Cosmos DB. 
And then we move on to that um, develop hub where you have all these different uh, capabilities. Uh, as I mentioned, if you are a data analyst and you want to uh, write the code as SQL commands, you have all these artifacts um, here um, as, as SQL. Uh, so that's the familiar uh, language that you can um, use to, to run those queries. Um, if you go to a, a more of a notebook, a code first experience, um, similar kind of capability for data scientists, uh, what you see in the open um, uh, open source uh, space, uh, you can ro run those um, notebooks uh, with any language of choice, either PySpark, uh, Scala, .NET, or, or even the SQL as well. Um, from the similar uh, pane, you have all these artifacts um, in, in terms of the code uh, free experience where you can build those pipelines uh, automatically uh, by a few clicks um, and, and, and you can join, you can, you can have multiple different stages uh, in, in those pipelines as well. And, and once you have created those pipelines, you have run those pipelines, you can quickly jump on to and, and create those um, Power BI reports to enable the business to get the uh, value out of the data that you have just uh, ingested. So, so that's the uh, power of Synapse um, in, in summary. And, and of, of a few tabs, like you have this orchestrate tab, again, you can see which uh, pipelines are being productionized. You go to a monitor tab where you have all these pipeline runs you, you can monitor. Um, and then uh, the last one is where you manage these different pools. Either this is a SQL on demand or, or the Spark pool that you uh, manage. Uh, that brings to uh, end of the demonstration. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, I'll be happy to answer. Well, that was uh, really great, Sana. I think um, you know, like it's it's just uh, really cool to yeah. Again, we we don't get a lot of Microsoft Azure talks um, at the meetup, but um, that was a great overview. Also, I just loved you know like the the history that you put together. Um, yeah. You know of how we got to here, <laughs> yeah. That the Hadoop days, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I I um, I have a disclaimer. So I worked for Teradata for almost ten years, yeah. and uh, with Cloudera as well. So I have uh, actually experienced that uh, first had experience in terms of both the platforms and then what I've seen in in the industry, uh, especially with the Hadoop world as well. I I think uh, I have often had those discussions with the customers where they wanted to offload EDW and they had no idea like either this platform can do that and especially not the skills to manage that uh, framework because I, I think it was a much more specialized framework which required specific engineering skills and, and not without having that engineering skills in your uh, organization, I think it 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 was I think a a wrong a misaligned dream to venture into that <laughs> space. Yeah, what was Teradata's Hadoop platform again? I, I remember using it. Uh, Aster. Aster. Yeah, yeah. Aster. Yeah. Aster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, good times. Um, cool. We've got a couple of questions. Um, yeah. I guess you know, like you mentioned, this whole multi-cloud debate, and and the reason why, you, like, give us a little bit of bit of the reason why you'd pick one cloud doesn't necessarily need to be one particular color of cloud, but um, I guess you know, data egress was mentioned. You know, have you got any comments on that? Um, I, I think in terms of a multi-cloud where um, you see a lot of these discussion that uh, people would uh, lean on to the multi-cloud that they would say that we don't want a vendor lock-in. Uh, we don't want to go to those back to those days where we have this uh, stringent lock-in in, into a specific vendor. But I think uh, that that argument doesn't hold uh, true as well because um, with the identity that you have, uh, I think all these different clouds the the identity mechanism doesn't match uh, and it's not a seamless experience if you move from one cloud to the other cloud so i i think that whole space if you even decide to go for a specific vendor or any any of the three let's say the three largest uh, public cloud vendors you are already buying into that uh, vendor lock-in with with that identity and with those uh, data platform if you establish on that. So I, I think that that whole argument goes away, if, uh, first of all, for the vendor lock-in. The other part is where you say that 
um, I can have more of a disaster recovery or a more high availability in terms of uh, having those different uh, going into different data centers, which are separated from each other. I, I think, as you mentioned, like the whole that uh, data egress would have specific challenges. A and then what's the connectivity uh, channel between those, uh, how do you manage that network connectivity as well between those and making sure that, that uh, it, it's uh, more efficient uh, enough as compared to a specific vendor. I, I think these are uh, at least two key challenges that you would face. And then I think in, in my experience uh, for at least the last uh, five, six years, a lot of these bigger uh, clients uh, that I've worked with and, and uh, I've worked with uh, the big fours uh, in the public sectors as well as in, in the financial sector. And often the clients, they uh, struggle to manage even one cloud platform. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's uh, sufficient to say that what challenges would you feel uh, and you would face in terms of if you are going through uh, through a multi-cloud kind of uh, configuration and how do you manage those? Um, specifically, when I made that comment in terms of a multi-cloud should not be a good strategy for a data platform specifically, it could be good if you are um, uh, you are balancing your act with an IaaS uh, kind of a platform uh, where you have different apps that you would provision for a specific vendor where they have more capabilities in that. But for a data platform, I think it, it, it doesn't make sense because as I mentioned, the key point is around the uh, identity as well as that whole data movement. That's a killer uh, for, for, for a specific modern data warehouse uh, architecture in, in my view. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. Uh, yeah, great points. Um, okay, so um, Rowan Guitar Pit, I, I don't know whether I pronounce that name. I, apologies to you. Um, but he, uh, they've asked um, how does Synapse Analytics incorporate if someone wants to use, say, Kafka instead of um, Azure Streams Analytics? Um, in, in terms of that, um... Uh, but I've so, uh, but I've actually uh, just give you a glimpse of uh, what the Synapse brings in as a unified platform. But in terms of if you have a requirement around specific Kafka and you have already made those existing investments into the Kafka uh, framework, and if you want to bring in as a first party uh, capability, it would be an HD Insight that we bring in. So you can have Kafka experience in HD Insight on Azure. Uh, so that's one thing. But even if you think that you have a Kafka cluster on your own, either it's on-premise or even if you provision that on Azure or any other cloud vendor, uh, you have that experience that you can actually integrate it with the pipelines in, in, in uh, uh, with Synapse in terms of when you create those pipelines, as I've uh, just uh, quickly shown you uh, with the pipeline, uh, with the code free experience as well, you can have those plugins that you can create uh, to ingest from those uh, different connectors. So, so, so that's uh, with Azure Data Factory, or with uh, custom integration as well, you can integrate all these different um, ingestion uh, tools uh, with uh, Synapse. Yeah. Oh, cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah. So um, I, we had a, another question from Nicholas real quick on, um, you know, can we get your slides? So uh, is that cool if we share them around? We can discuss it later if you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. I'll definitely uh, share my slides. Yeah. Yeah. One other question from Pat uh, Coprador. Um, so what's your take, Sana, around the effort required in doing data engineering these days compared to how it was before, I guess, you know, even sort of talks to uh, Dom's uh, talk from Fivetran, but, um, you know, perhaps the, the Microsoft point of view. Okay, I, I I feel like a dinosaur uh, when I would when I would tell you like I, I have uh, no experience with Fivetran and it, it, it uh, like even the DBT and Fivetran. This was my first experience, and I, I'll admit it. And it seems so much uh, seamless, despite like even being a, a command line tools. It was much more seamless and integrated as compared to what I used to do uh, myself <laughs> back into those days. Like I, I would give you an example. I I worked with Informatica. Uh, Ab initio, if somebody knows that, uh, uh, data stage, as well as uh, uh, I think there was an ODI, which is uh, used to be Synapse, uh, uh, 
uh, Synopsis, sorry, uh, Oracle Data Integrator as well. So all these ETL tools uh, in back in those days where data engineering wasn't a buzz at this <laughs> at that moment. I think it was a, a cumbersome experience in terms of all these tools would do a line by line or, or a row by row experience. So that was one of the first challenge that you would face with these tools. And specifically for any of these tasks, like uh, there is a different panel for development. There's a different panel for uh, uh, stitching together different data sources and targets, then there's a different uh, UI for managing or administration. So it was a kind of a nightmare, uh, to be honest. And, and then you have to manage all these different, uh, install those on your machine and then go get your uh, permissions uh, from a larger organization. It's a, it's a nightmare to get these things done. But I, I think uh, we have uh, achieved as an industry that we have reduced that time frame from like months of development into at least, uh, at least a few weeks. And that's where um, I feel really excited uh, about Azure uh, Synapse as well, that we are uh, trying to invest in, in a way that we can even shorten that, that time frame. And as you can see, that it's bringing those silos down to where even as a data engineer, you can have that experience uh, from a code intensive to a low code experience in the, in the same panel uh, with your different permissions if you're a data scientist, you can have a totally different experience without uh, having different going going to different tools or going to different uh, UI interfaces. Yeah, yeah very cool. Uh, fun fact about DBT: there's a SQL Server plugin, so no excuses. You got to give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, yeah. I've just uh, queried that, so I, I've seen it. Yes. <laughs> oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vinci, any thoughts? No, that was really, really great talk. I have never like um, heard so much about Microsoft. I haven't even looked at it, so that was a really good overview. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's great to see all the clouds. You know, have uh, really great offerings. So no matter what what cloud you're on, you know, like um, you know, try to be as neutral as possible. Um, you know, yep. when we can um, yep. at the meetup. You know, it's great to see that there's so many options available to help you sort of get it getting up and running um you know uh the, the the trouble today is actually like um you know doing comparisons and you know vendor vendor reviews and things like that it's like oh my gosh there's fifty thousand options to choose from how do i narrow the field but um and they're all, all pretty awesome so uh you know no disrespect to any of them that, that they're all yep. great so it, it's a, it's a noisy space and everybody does everything <laughs> to summarize you, yeah and if you wait five minutes um you know the current problem that one vendor has probably yeah. gets solved in a you know in a few weeks time anyway so yeah yeah anyway, good times well thanks again that's a that's been an awesome uh another data engineering and dbt combined meetup if i don't say so myself i personally learned a bunch so Thanks, big round of applause to all of our speaker speakers, Hamza, Dom, and Sana. You can catch up, um, obviously, on on the stream. You know all, all the talks tonight on our YouTube channel, Data NJU, and obviously you can continue the conversation at Data Engineers uh, Meetup uh, dot um, You know this place to do introductions. If you've got like jobs on offer or you're looking for a job. Feel free to, you know, go there and, and say hi and, you know, chat about any tech problems you've got. We're all a bit sort of uh, COVID fatigued at the minute. So it's a great way to socialize. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely enjoy the conversation. So thanks once again, and we'll uh, see you next month.